Just one. We'll sing this song until you come. Glory be to the righteous one. Good morning, church. Good to see you all here this morning. My name is Neil Sanders. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Grace, if we haven't met. It's my pleasure to welcome you and invite you into engaging us or engage with us in worship this morning. If you're new, let me give you the lay of the land. So there are um, uh, giving boxes, connect cards, and uh, paper bulletins as you enter into the room. If you're more of a digital person, you can go to sundaygrace.org, and you will find uh, all of those as well, digital giving option or a digital connect card, digital bulletin. So go all the way there. If, you're, if you are a guest... Man, we really encourage you to fill out that uh, Connect card because we have a free digital gift that we'd like to extend to you as a, a welcome to come into Grace this morning. But let me give you guys some announcements before we uh, go into worship this morning. This Wednesday night is our El Salvador report. If you're interested in learning more about what our church is doing in the country of El Salvador, you can come this Wednesday night at 6.30 and hear all about that, all the opportunities that will be coming forward in the uh, coming months, years, uh, that what we continue to do down in El Salvador. So that's this Wednesday night. Next Sunday is Grace 101. That's a class for those who are exploring church membership or those who just want to learn more about our church. 
It's a one-day, one-hour class that takes place during the Sunday school hour. Space is limited, so we would love for you, if you want to learn more about Grace, to sign up for that online through the app, or there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. You can just write your name down at Old School. That's how we're doing things, too. There's also, at that same uh, sign-up table, there's also Trunk or Treat. That's going to be next week as well from 6 to 7.30. Uh, please invite your friends. Bring your kids out. There's going to be a safe place for them to trick or, trick or treat as they go in our parking lot. But uh, also, we need some more cars, so if you'd like to bring your car out, decorate your trunk, and pass out some candy, you can uh, hit that sign-up sheet out in the lobby as well. Same lobby, same sign-up sheet table. There's also a sign-up for our Thanksgiving dinner, which is going to be on November 16th at 6 o'clock here at the church. We'd love for you to sign up for that because we need to know how many cookie or how many uh, turkeys to cook and how many deviled eggs to make. I don't. Maybe there won't be deviled eggs. I don't know. You guys want deviled eggs? Yeah. All right. All right. We'll see what we can do. All right. So sign up. RSVP for that. Help us out there. Again, you can do that online or uh, in the lobby on that sign-up sheet. Okay. There's one more announcement, and that is Operation Christmas Child is coming up next month. Uh, Nick is going to tell us a little bit more about that. But before that happens, we're going to watch this video. Let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl, who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. Can you hear that? All right. Okay, so <clears throat> one verse has come across my mind over the last couple days, and uh, it's out of Timothy. It says, do not neglect your gift. We do not realize the gift that we have in America when uh, something as simple as a box of crayons can equal a week's wages in some of these countries. And it's not the monetary value that we're giving. It's the hope. It's the chance um, for eternal change in these children's lives. Um, we're doing collection from November 14th through 21st. I've got sign-up sheets. I need helpers uh, that will be greeters to collect the shoe boxes here so we can pass them on to the next processing location. I also need uh, loaders that will help uh, load 40 to 60 pound cartons on Monday, November 21st. So if you have the ability, please uh, help me with that. Um, it's uh, profound, these words that I hear where they're talking about changing children's lives for eternity. Each year, I hear stories of children that when they get these shoe boxes, 
they ask the question, who loves me this much? That's a work of God. So uh, just ask you to help me with that. Thank you. Awesome. And Nick, would you transition us into worship with the reading of scripture? And would you all please stand? Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and the loud, like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And all God's people said... Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. They're still rolling in this morning. Well, come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Jesus is well. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. With all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. With all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your with all your strength I will serve the Lord with all my heart With all my soul, with all my mind With all my strength I will serve the Lord with all my heart With all my soul Oh my heart, oh my soul, oh my mind, oh my strength, oh my heart, oh my soul, oh my mind, oh my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, oh my soul, and all my mind, with all.
Thank you so much. Thank you for the word that became flesh. Thank you for the blood that was shed for us. God, we, uh, we are a wretched people. And your word says that, that all have sinned and fall short of your glory. And God, it also says that the wages of sin is death. And we've all missed the mark and we all deserve your wrath and punishment. But Lord, because of what Christ did for us, the blood that was shed. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So God, we celebrate that this morning as we come under your house. We give you worship and honor and praise and glory. We ask that you open our hearts and our eyes to receive the truth of the word this morning as we open it and look inside. God, may you, uh, may you be pleased with our offering this morning of worship. May we give you our full attention. Glory to your name, Lord. Amen. 
Well, as you're seated, please find Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles, and I do know I need to introduce myself to many of you. I'm your pastor. <laughs> I, uh, if you're a guest, you don't know this, but this is maybe the most shocking Sunday of our 22-plus uh, years. I don't normally dress like this, and, uh, but there's a reason for it. Trust me, if you ever see me like this, there is a reason for it. And uh, something, uh, the, the way I wanted to start was say something important is happening if you see me dressed like this. There's a, there's a word that kept coming to mind even this morning thinking something meaningful is happening if I'm dressed like this. And people have already asked, who died, right? Who's getting married? Um, and truth of the matter is both of those things have happened and are happening around here. Many of you may not know this yet, Sue Oliver was sick and she did pass away last week. And so, yeah, that's, it's always uh, shocking news and tough to hear. She's a dear lady who knew her Savior, and she's in heaven. Her family knows that, and so we mourn, but we rejoice. And uh, just uh, her services will be next Thursday, just so you know. Next Thursday morning here at the church, there'll be a visitation at 10 and a service at 11. And so um, you can mark your calendars. We'll try to get the word out. But be in prayer for Sue Oliver and her family. Um, again, they know the grief but hope um, truth that the Bible gives us, and so be with them. That's the funeral side of things. Um, there's also a wedding today, in fact, and so I, later this afternoon, will be performing a wedding. So that's the second meaningful thing that's happening, and um, I had time to go home and change, but I thought with two out of three, I might as well dress like this for the day. Um, I don't know if they serve iced tea to people dressed like this at Quick Trip, but I'm going to give it a shot today, <laughs> and uh, hopefully I'll still, maybe I'll get it free. I don't know how that's going to work out. There's a third meaningful thing, and I, and I, I, you know, I don't want to put this on par or anything like this, but maybe I do. We have been talking all month about how we love our church, not just Grace Community Church, but the church. The church is God's chosen institution. He bought the church with the blood of his son. Christ paid for this. And being a part of this is meaningful. It's significant. And I really do hope that you remember, oh yeah, remember that one Sunday when Pastor George, something important happened that Sunday. What was it? He talked about being a part of God's body, his family here on earth. It's an important, meaningful thing. And so let that sink in. I, wa I want you to understand, to see how we view church membership. Think about it this way. I, I want to take a poll. How many of you are members of Sam's Club? How many of you are members of Costco? Oh, man, really? Let's not fight about this, but how many of you are members of both? Uh, so you can't make up your mind, right? <laughs> now, I want you to view your membership to Costco or Sam's Club and compare it to how you view your membership at the church. See, many people wrongly think that the church is less like Costco or Sam's Club. I'll pay my dues. I'm glad it's closed. It's convenient. They're open when I need them. I can get stuff there. But guess what? If I don't want to go this week, I don't have to go this week. I don't need anything. We, we sometimes view church membership as a, like a, a wholesale club, right? That it's, I, I've paid in, now I, it's there when I need it and when I don't. The, the, the Bible doesn't paint that kind of picture of what the church is about. The church is, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, people fully devoted to each other, to the word of God, to what's going on around here. And so I want to, if nothing else, move us from Costco membership to church membership, okay? And uh, to do this, we've looked at this passage a couple weeks ago, so I've got you at, Hope, at Acts chapter 2. I also want you to think ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I did this with giving, and we, Paul has a lot to say to the churches. By the way, last week I preached on giving, one of the rare times I do that. We had... This is not exaggeration. We had the worst offering we've had all year last week. <laughs> Even worse than Nehemiah Fest when nobody's in the building. And so I expected to pick up this week, I hope. But God is good. One of the points I made last week was we are regular givers. It's not just when we show up. And guess what? By the time some of the online stuff came on, it all balances out. So thank you for your generosity. But it was kind of a, a humbling thing. I don't expect anybody to join the church after what I say today. So this familiar passage, Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay, let's pray. Um, God, as we digest this passage a little bit, as we, um, these familiar words, help us to see it in light of our commitment level um, to the local church, to your body, God, to your family, to this temple here. Um, God, you have um, designed us to, to need one another and to meet together in our need for you. And so, God, would you just uh, speak through your word and your spirit and convict us, God, and challenge us, encourage us by those things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, go, uh, do go to second. Oh, don't go there yet. Sorry. Stay in Acts. Go to, back a couple chapters to Acts chapter 2, verse 31. So just a few verses earlier. Because I want, I, I covered this a little bit last week, but the chapter 2, verse 42 starts with the word they. Who are they? And I said this a couple weeks ago. I'll say it again today. These are people getting saved. And of all the things I say today, please understand this. Church membership does not save you, okay? There are many people on the rolls at churches, and they're not saved. And there are people that are saved that are not on church rolls. I get that. And so I'm not presenting today that unless you're a member of a church or a member of this church, then you're not good to go, okay? I'm not saying that. They are saved people. So if, look at verse 36. Peter says, all, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And I'll, I'll get into this a little bit, but Jesus does not just save us. He is to be sovereign in our lives. He is our Lord, and he's the one God promised to come and die for our sins and deliver us. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? If this is true that Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the Lord, what do we need to do about that? And Peter replied, repent, change your way of thinking, and be baptized. That means go all in with this thing called Jesus. To be baptized is to publicly declare, is to be immersed with the, the stuff of the gospel. It's, it's to just take that in. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the key, Okay. That's when I say church membership can't save you. I can't forgive your sins. Our church can't forgive your sins. We can point you to the one who can, which is Jesus Christ, right? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're all indwelled with the Holy Spirit. This promise, or the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. For all who will call, on, uh, call the Lord our God will call. For all whom the Lord our God will call. God is still doing that today. He's calling people to his son, Jesus Christ. With this and many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. When I said this is meaningful stuff, I mean it. Peter doesn't say it might be nice if. He is warning them there's consequences if you reject this and he's pleading with them. He desperately wants to see them come to Christ. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And I want you to know that. We live in a world that does not agree with a lot of the things we stand on in the Word of God. It's, every generation is corrupt in the sense that we are distinct from them, and I'll get into that. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And then verse 42, they are the ones who are now devoting themselves. So here's my outline, and it's, it's as simple as can be. You can probably fill it in for yourself. But the first point is, who is a church? What does it mean to be a church member? You're a Christian. You're saved. There's a thing, it's a big fancy word they use in seminaries called regenerate church membership. The church is just not like Costco or Sam's Club. You just sign up and go. It is made up of the saved people of earth who are gathered together. There is Big C Church meaning we're meeting together, other local churches are meeting, and we're all Christians and we'll all be in heaven someday. But then there's also lo little c, local churches, right? And we are saved, all of us, through Christ. Technically speaking, the church is saved people. And there's a mixture in, I think, every church, those who are and profess to be and those who aren't but are, you know, think that church membership or good life or works or whatever makes them good. But we're Christians is the bottom line, and that speaks to our salvation. And just to be clear again, I'm not talking about you have to join Grace Community Church in order to be saved. I know that, 
okay? You know that, I hope. But it's more than that. When we get saved, a few weeks ago, I talked about the ABGs of salvation, right? It's just not accepting the forgiveness of sin. It's being baptized, declaring that publicly, and devoting your life to following Jesus Christ. And there's a bunch of other things. I get to G there, right? There's a lot of other things there. We eventually get equipped to serve and go out into the world. Salvation is the starting point, and too many people view it as the ending point. It is the introduction into the body of Christ where a lot of different things happen. And if you take notes, I didn't put them here. I'm going to give you four D words. They are devoted. We've already covered that. The people together, they were, it said they continued to be devoted. They continued to the apostles. It's something they're serious about. It's their lifestyle. It's the most important. It's the most pressing thing in their life. They were devoted. Here's the other thing that I think we're missing. And um, we're working on some helps in this area. But it's not just devoted to the stuff we are discipled there should be maturity in a christian we call it growing faith right that that people should develop in this we call it discipleship or maturity or however you want to do that the great commission tells us to go out what and share the gospel baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit teaching them to obey everything i have commanded you go and make what disciples the full Great Commission is not just go share the gospel and get somebody saved and get them to heaven. It's then to help them mature in their faith so that they bring glory to Christ by the way they live their lives. That they take on a Christ-like character. James would put it this way, don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves, do what it says. Again, not just our church and not exclusively our church, there's many people sitting in church that have the best intentions. They hear a sermon they're ready to go. They sit in a Bible study class, a Sunday school class. They're ready to go. And by the time the chiefs are trailing in the first quarter, all those good intentions are gone. And guess what? Week after week, year after year, they hear good teachings. They intend to do something with it and never grow. Okay? That's called discipleship. And the way God, I think, has designed us. And, and you have to ask your, this yourself. Do you really want to grow in Christian maturity? Do you want to take on Christ-like character? It's hard to do that. It's scary to do that. Frankly, it's more fun sometimes not to do that because you can just be the boss. But the church should be a place where we not only are devoted to one another because we believe the same stuff, but we're building into one another. And I should and you should have people in this church that you give permission to say, help me fight sin in my life. Help me find my place of ministry. When God promises, and, and it's in red letter, when Jesus promises the Great Commission, he says, I'll be with you when you do this. Even in church discipline, and nobody kind of likes that word, but church discipline is a way of saying, hey, you know, we're in this together, and the way you're acting, this, it's not hanging out with the Bible here. When Jesus says these things, you like these verses where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there too. He's talking about when we're together doing life to such an extent that we're building each other up to the extent that we'll hold each other to the feet. Jesus says, I'm there with you when you're doing that kind of stuff. Okay? And so it's this disciple. The other thing it is, and this goes... Again, maybe I'm jumping around, but there's another D word. I, what have I given you here? Devotion, discipleship, discipline, and distinction. Now, we're not weird just to be weird. But what we believe, based on the word of God, is weird to the world. They can't fathom that we actually believe this stuff, let alone that we would actually let this stuff speak into our lives and influence how we think about things and behave about things. It's one thing to say you go to church. It's another to even say you love God or even love Jesus. But when you start, like, butting heads with the world because you think God says this, but the world says this, that's kind of where the challenge comes. We're supposed to be weird like that. We're supposed to, the, the way the Bible calls it is a distinction. In the Old Testament, God would say over and over to Israel, there's a difference between you and the rest of the world. I'm, I, I'm, I'm caring for you in such a way that there's a distinction, that people will see a difference between God's people and the world. That's, that's, why, that's part of what he's doing through the Exodus. That's part of what he's doing in the Promised Land. That's what he's doing in a lot of the laws. There's a law, and I'll, this is where I'll have you go to 2 Corinthians. There's a law in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy that says things like, don't wear uh, clothes that are made out of different materials, right? Don't plant different seeds in the same field. And there, there's this one line, do not plow a field with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Okay? Anybody tried to do that recently? Nope. We just fire up the, the machine and go, right? Picture an ox, picture a donkey. Different animals, different paces, 
yoked together with a big stick. They have to move together. Do you think you're going to get a, 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 a straight line out of the two? Do you think your field is going to produce the way it's supposed to out of the two? No, because one's going to pull the other and it's just not going to go well. Now, when I have you turn, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I mentioned there's a wedding today, and this is a passage, this happens a few times in the Bible, where we're so used to putting them into context like weddings that we don't realize what Paul really said when he wrote it the first time. It doesn't mean weddings are not a good application of this, but what does um, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 say? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Okay? Have you, you've heard that, right? You've heard it to young people dating. You've heard it in people in tough relationships. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Paul's not talking about marriage there. Again, it's a good and right application of that truth. He's talking to you and me in the church and saying, y'all, you don't belong hitched to that. You don't think like them. You don't act like them. You've got a different purpose. You're, you're supposed to be in the field doing straight lines. That donkey is going to pull you aside. And if we're being influenced and wanting to be cool and all that kind of stuff, we're so yoked to them, then God's not going to get out of us what he's supposed to get out. And he goes on to say, what can light and darkness have together and, and wickedness and righteousness? But the whole point is there, we are supposed to be distinct. And if you look down at verse 18, for instance, if you do this, well, let me look at verse 17. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. He's not saying you can't live in this world. He's just saying don't let the world live in you, basically. The way some people say it is the ship belongs in water, but water does not belong in a ship, right? We live in a fallen world, but if that fallen world just so fills us that we act like and think like them. And then he says in verse 18, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And the word Lord Almighty there basically means this, God has his hand in everything. God cares about how you think about politics and relationships and money and all this stuff. That's that lordship part of this. And so the first point we have, we are committed to the point that we're distinct from the world in the way we think and act. And we need each other to do that. Because if all you hear is what's on TV or on social media or even your friends, and you never gather around people who think like you, then you're going you're gonna to begin to drift that way. So first of all, we're committed. Secondly, I'm sorry, first of all, we're Christians. That's what a Christian means. Secondly, we're committed. Let me give you a few things that we're committed to. They say in, in Acts they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship and all that. We here at Grace are committed to the Word of God. And I've covered that before, and, and we'll say it again. We do what we do because we think God's Word says that or instructs that. Or if we have questions, what does God's Word say about that? We have a list of beliefs, in fact, that um, as a Baptist church, we believe technically our creed is the Baptist faith and message. That's our official doctrinal stance. You can go read that and know what we believe on any number of things. But... We've boiled it down a little bit. We believe the Bible is written by God, inspired by God. Uh, is he inspired men? It's God's revelation of himself to man. He's the author. He's salvation. It has salvation for its end. It's truth. There's no mixture of error. It's the testimony of Christ. Christ is the focus of the Bible. So we believe that kind of stuff right? What we believe about God, he is, there is only one true and living God. He's the creator and sustainer and ruler of the universe. He existed from all eternity and reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a distinction in those personal attributes, but without division in nature and essence or being. We believe Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He perfectly revealed and did the will of God. He took upon himself human nature yet was without sin. Jesus died as a substitutionary death on the cross to redeem us from sin. He is now alive in heaven where he serves as our one mediator. He affects reconciliation between God and man. He now dwells in all believers and will return someday to judge the world and finish the redemption mission. What we believe about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, fully divine. He inspired the writings of and helps us understand the scriptures through his illumination, he lives in every Christian from the moment of salvation and provides the Christian with power for holy living. He exalts Christ and is the guarantee that God will bring the Christian into the fullness of Christ. A couple more. What we believe about men and women. 
Men and women are God's special creation, made in his image. Man fell from the original state of innocence and inherited a nature and environment that is inclined towards sin. Every person of every race possesses full dignity and is worthy of respect and Christian love. What we believe about salvation, it is only through Jesus Christ that man can have a personal relationship with God. This is a free gift of grace and is offered to all who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. By his blood, Jesus obtained eternal life for all who believe. And what we believe about the church. The church is the body of Christ in the world today. The church is universal, including all redeemed of all ages, and local, including baptized believers, associated by a covenant of faith and, faith and fellowship in the gospel. The church observes two ordinances of Christ, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is governed by his laws, exercised um, the rights and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeks to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, why would I do all that? Because you could be here a long time and not know what we believe. That's what we believe. And we believe it's all found in the Bible and do that. But we need one another, frankly, to keep our minds on those kind of things. Because, again, that is not what the world believes. And so we're committed to the word of God. We're also committed to the, doing the work of God. And we've, when you read in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're saved by grace, it goes on to say, for you are God's workmanship created to do good works. We believe everybody here is committed to the work of God, that, there's, that God has gifted you in such a way you can be a part of the ministry. You could be a part of what God is doing here on earth. Thirdly, and I gave a shot at this last week, they were contributors. So I'm not going to do another money sermon because you all dudded out on me last week, okay? That's not the intention here. But it says there they, they sold their property and their possessions. They were generous was the word I kept saying last week. And I want you to get beyond money now and just realize that you need to contribute. This is where the Sam's Club or the, the Costco thing, you know, this, the distinction is here. You are here, and, and please don't make it sound like I'm lecturing you right now, because I am here for the same reason. We are here, not to say what do I get out of that, but what can I give into that? We are, we are to be contributors to what's going on around here. We are not consumers. And that does affect our money, and we talked about that last week, and I'll leave it there. It also affects, I think, your Christian maturity. If you expect just to show up and all of a sudden blossom into a mature Christian without taking some initiative, it's just not going to happen. The illustration that many on our staff heard recently was the, how, a, how a bird feeds baby birds. So I will play the role of the mama bird right now, okay? You pay me to digest the word of God. I chew on it all week. You open your mouth and I spit it out at you on Sunday mornings. Yuck, right? But is that not an apt illustration for many people when it comes to their Christian growth? They, ex they just want to know what somebody else has learned about it, what you've spent time doing. And because of that, you remain baby birds. And, and the author of Hebrews said, you ought to be teaching by now, and yet we've got to teach you the ABCs all over again. So when I say you contribute, I don't just mean your money. I mean you're, you contribute to what's going on around here, including your own maturity, including your own great growth, your own discipleship. So I've talked about money and that. Let me give you a couple ideas. We, right today, you heard an announcement about Operation Christmas Child. You can contribute to ministry in that way. I know they'll take volunteers. Coming up in a month, we do Toy Store. You can bet we need donations and volunteers for that. I guarantee you, Neil and Angie would love to have some more child care workers. I could go on and on. I, will, I think this is news to the church as a whole, but last week, Trimble Baptist Church was going to vote whether or not they trusted us to you know, kind of partner with them and replant that church. They voted yes. So like it or not, we now are in charge of another church. And I told people this week, I said, it's like having a baby for the first time. You bring it home, and you're like, yeah, all excited, and then the door's shut, and everybody goes home, and you're like, oh, now what do we do, right? Beginning next week, what happens at Trimble is our responsibility. And I don't mean that like we better get our, you know, ducks in a row. I mean, God has chosen for us to shepherd that church, too. We will be held on how we did that. And, and the reason I tell you that is there will be people that will need to say, that's, that, that's what God's calling me to do. I'm going to, be, I'm going to find out what's going on up there. I may be involved in leadership. I may just go worship there for a while. But we need to replant that church in such a way that it brings glory to God and reaches people for the gospel just up the road. Another area that you'll hear about this Wednesday is El Salvador. 
our teams have gone to El Salvador for nearly 20 years now, I believe, and God's still at work down there. And this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock or 6.30, I think it is, they will give a report on what God has done down there, what God may be doing down there. So if you don't normally come on a Wednesday night, come this Wednesday night. They'll be down in the big classroom, A4 and 5, and they'll tell you all about El Salvador. So they were contributors. Fourthly, they were connected. And I've, we've covered some of this before, so I'll move quickly. But they did life together. They were connected to one another. Um, I am well aware, and frankly, there's, bar, there's part of this in me, that if I just started going to a church, let's say, I, and I, it's odd because I've always been employed by a church, so I never really just am part of it, you know. But if, if I was ever in that season of life and I just went to a church, part of me would like to just slide in and slide out. The, the problem with that, frankly, sometimes is people don't think they need a church until, guess what, they realize they need a church. And we try real hard. If, if you haven't met Jeff Maxwell around here, it's because you snuck in the back door and in a laundry basket or something because he will meet you at the front door you can hide here if you want you can you can come and go and I, my apologies to anybody we've missed in that but take the initiative to get connected to people you can do that even by serving with one another or get in a small group or get in a sunday school class or one of the bible studies we offer but get connected i'm, tell, I'm just telling you we're designed for that you, we need one another. Get connected to God, too. Make sure you're in the Word. And fifthly, it may sound weird, but they were counted. Because some people will question, well, should you even be talking about church membership? In fact, I, a good buddy of mine, I just talked to him this week, they don't have church membership. Now, they gauge whether you're actively involved or not in a different way, so it's not like they're taking this lightly. But... What do you do with somebody that says, well, I don't, yeah, I'm there, you know, I'm in, but I just don't want to be a member of that church. Um, I, I, I may not convince you this morning, but let me just start with this. Somebody was keeping track. They knew that after Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. They knew that shortly after this, 5,000 people were on the books. Somebody was keeping track. When it comes to church discipline, in fact, it says, treat them as somebody outside the church. Well, how do you know who's in and who's out? Except somebody's keeping track. And you can look at the example of even Jesus Christ, that there's a Lamb's book of life. And it says if you're in there, you spend eternity with God. And if not, you're thrown into the lake of fire. And Grace Community Church does not have the end all be all. God's not going to get to the end of history and say, let me see your planning center spreadsheet to make sure they're good or not. That's not the way it works. But God does know whose are his and whose are not. And this is the weight I feel on this. I and our staff and our leadership are responsible for the flock that God has placed under our care, okay? And I, and I don't know if you can appreciate the weight of that. But sometimes we don't do well at that, and sometimes we do real well at that. But I will have to give an account to the people of Grace Community Church and now Trimble Baptist Church. Now, this is where I'm kind of putting it on you. Because if you're not a part of the flock, you understand, then I may feel that burden, but this has got to be all in on both sides. And I can't be responsible, and we can't be responsible for people that don't, I, I don't, I don't want to make this a work thing or anything like that, but if you're not all in and then we kind of miss it, I, I, I don't know what to do with that. Does that make sense? Is that fair? For this, I want to, I want to show you, um, and, I, and I'll wrap up with this a little bit, Numbers chapter 1 Moses is told to go out and take a census of the whole Israelite community by their families. And he lists them by name, one by one. And he says to Aaron, he says, God says to Moses and Aaron, go out and count them according to their divisions, all the men in Israel who are 20 years old or more. And here's the line I want you to get, and able to serve in the army. That was not just a numbers game. That was who is on our side. And I want to leave you with this phrase. If you, want to, if you want to be counted in, can you be counted on? Does that make sense? See, we want the Costco membership too many times. We want to be counted in the group. We want the discounts. We want the bulk, you know. We want to buy the goods. We want the free food samples. 
But you're not down there cleaning their aisles and pushing their carts in because you're not all in. They, they can't count on you for that. And if we're not careful, that mentality comes. God, God has intended all along not just to bring you into the membership of the church, but to help you discover your gifts, to flourish, frankly, in those gifts, and through that to build up the body of Christ, to reach the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that his son is glorified. And so I leave you with that question. If you want to be counted in, can you be counted on? Now, this may seem self-serving, but we have a membership class next week, Grace 101, 10 a.m. If you've never joined this church officially, that's a great way to discover many things we've talked about, who we are, what we believe, and what it takes to be a member. If you're on that list already, then the challenge still stands. How are you viewing your membership? Are you all in and, and all that kind of stuff? And as I said from the very beginning, and I mean this sincerely, um, I would love for every last one of you to be an official member of Grace Community Church. More importantly, I want your name written on the Lamb's Book of Life. You need to know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That means you've accepted his free gift of salvation. You need to know if you don't, that you're thrown to all eternity in the lake of fire. That's the most important decision that can be made today. Now, you can make some other decisions, but don't bypass that one. Some of you may say, I need to be baptized. Some of you may say, I need to be part of the, the church officially. You may just need to feel like God's calling you into ministry and, and you want us to help you with that or just need prayer. Those are the kind of decisions we make at times like this. And as we, we're, we're, we're going to sing a song that says, Lord, I need you. That's exactly right. There's a, there's a verse I think we've quoted one time that says, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve. I cannot tell you how many times great things happen here at Grace Community Church, and I think this way, the Lord does not treat us as our skills deserve either. He's doing incredible things here that are way beyond what we can do, okay? And so we need him for all this stuff. And so if you don't know him and you're not serving him, I just beg you to do that. I plead with you and warn you in that. So as we stand and sing, Lord, I need you, you can come forward for prayer, or pray with me. I happen to know, by the way, don't forget I'm dressed like this for a reason. There's a wedding today. I ha a bird told me there's a wedding next week too, and it's probably somebody most of you don't know, but I do know at least one of those couples, and I think both of them are coming up, and we're going to pray for their upcoming marriages at the end of the service as well. So if I'm speaking to you, and I, you know where you are, Go ahead and make your way up during this time too, okay? Let's stand and let's sing.
to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Have a seat, everybody, except these four people. Y'all come up here. Just stand across here so everybody can see you. This will be easy to remember because there's two Johns up here, okay? This is John Dalby and Kara Barnes. They get married in how many hours, John? Uh, All right. Just a few more hours. This after six hours. Kara knows. And uh, so I knew they were coming forward, and they just want the blessing of the church and just to know uh, one of the things I always say at ceremony, it's not just them, it's the witnesses there that really build into this. So we're going to pray for their upcoming, not just wedding ceremony, but their marriage together. And then this is John and Emily. Um, John and Emily, not only was I not sure they were going to be up here, they didn't know they were going to be up here. There are parents involved in this setup and uh, thought it would be a good idea to pray for them. They get married next Saturday. And so uh, we want to pray for you all too and ask God's blessing on you. So would you all just... Draw your attention to them and to God as we just bless them and then we'll be dismissed. God, um, marriage is such a picture of, again, us being your bride. What a, what a neat way to blend those together, God. These marriages that are going to happen this afternoon and next week are a picture to the world of your love for us, your sacrifice for us. And God, just the, what it means to be married to you. And being a part of, of your, your bride, God. And so help us to see that connection, too. But we do pray for um, John and Kara, and John and Emily, God, that their homes would be full of the knowledge of the Lord, that your spirit would reign there, that you would walk with them through the difficult times and you would get the glory for the great times, God. Just let the ceremonies go great, but more importantly, may their years together um, be strong and a strong testimony to your love for us. Bless them, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed. Let me jump.